Every college football program goes through down periods, periods that feel hopeless and never-ending. Periods where it feels like you are watching the absolute bottom-of-the-barrel worst football in the nation. I know I've felt it, constantly, for the past three years. But it's hyperbole, right? More often than not, your team isn't actually the worst team ever. Hell, they're likely not even the worst team in your conference. But if they're not, what team is? Every year, there are programs whose down periods transition into a full-on collapse. A 2, 1, or no-win season. These cases usually only happen once, maybe twice a season. But when they do, they are truly a sight to behold. These teams are not created equal, however. Some are better than others. There is a worse college football team ever. And today, I've set out to find it. First, some qualifiers. Only major conferences are going to be judged here, partially due to them just being more entertaining to pick apart. These programs usually have the capital, support, and personnel to be serviceable at least. As opposed to smaller schools who, by and large, lack some or all of those resources. In other words, it feels more fair to shit on, say, Colorado than Florida International. Also, I'm lazy. There's that. Secondly, the sample size will be extending back to the year 2000, because past then, year-long stats become more and more sparse. For instance, 1997 Illinois has every single detail of their abysmal winless season readily available, while 1999 South Carolina has nothing, likely out of embarrassment. So, 21st century it is. Finally, the programs judged will be the teams with the worst overall record on the year. If two teams have identical bad records, both are judged. With these parameters set, how will these programs actually be judged? Let me introduce you to the formula. Made in-house, cobbled together with duct tape and a dream, the formula is my personal means of deriving the quality of a football program. The basic formula is this, offensive efficiency times a defensive efficiency multiplier, plus special teams efficiency, times the team's record, plus one, times the strength of schedule percentile. How do you get each component? Well, glad you asked. Offensive efficiency is total offensive yards per game, plus points per game, divided by offensive turnovers per game. Defensive efficiency is total yards per game, divided by the opponent's average yards per game, times defensive turnovers per game. Special teams efficiency is just punt average plus kick return average plus punt return average times field goal percentage. Record is self-explanatory, wins over games played. Finally, strength of schedule percentile is calculated by dividing the total number of games played by the average end of year rank of each team played, divided by total games played. Like that, we have a quantifiable means to judge team's quality. So, let's start on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. What would one of the best teams ever rank? 2019 LSU boasted perhaps the most dominant college offense ever, which, combined with a solid offense and a tough schedule, gave the Bayou Bengals a final score of 1,873.28. This is, by and large, the ceiling, what every program should strive for. Yet, not every team can be this good. What we need, instead, is an average. These are the 2017 Iowa Hawkeyes, a team I randomly chose because they sounded boring. The 2017 Pinstripe Bowl champions, the most notable thing to happen to this team, was a miraculous upset of top 5 Ohio State. Under the hood, those stats back up how average this team was. The offense was mediocre, the defense was solid, special teams were good. The only thing truly miraculous was the surprisingly brutal strength of schedule, giving this team a total score of 472.99. This is our standard. Anything better is a good team, anything worse is a bad team. And by God, does it get worse. 
Before exhuming the long untouched remains of these horrid seasons, let's take a minute to slander the conferences instead. In total, 36 teams were judged, with all major conferences of the 21st century being represented. At the bottom is the SEC and Big East, each with three teams in the sample. In terms of unique programs, the SEC is also near the bottom with two, while the Big East, curiously, had each of its representatives be unique programs. Next is the ACC and Big 12, both with six total worst teams and both having two unique programs represented. Next is the Big 10, with 8 total teams and 6 unique programs. And finally, there's the Pac-12, standing at the top of Shit Mountain with 10 total representatives and 6 unique programs. An impressive lack of performance. Standing as the best of the worst meet the 2003 Temple Owls. Compiling a surprisingly decent offensive and defensive efficiency score, the Owls were probably the most unlucky team in the sample. Throughout their 1-11 season, three of their losses went into overtime, including against number 12 Virginia Tech. There were also blowouts, including a 52-14 loss to number 2 Miami, and their schedule was, as a whole, pretty weak. But had it been a little sunny in Philadelphia, they likely wouldn't be in this sample of absolute worst teams. Thankfully for Temple, they'd improved the next year to 2-9, before getting kicked out of the Big East the next year. Putting to rest a Power 6 stint, Temple never really had the resources to afford. Finishing out the top 30 are more terrible teams with various bright spots to keep them from descending further. 2010 Washington State had an almost serviceable defense and offense that brought them a win out of nowhere from Oregon State. 2014 Colorado had an offense strong enough to not only bring them two wins, but bring them into overtime in two of their losses. Each are bad teams, but reasonably could have pulled off enough wins to not be the absolute worst their respective seasons had to offer. That benefit of the doubt goes away pretty quickly. In the 20s, you see a lot of one-and-done teams, programs whose absolute rock bottoms are shown here, and they never return. 2007 Minnesota, 2013 Cal, and 2005 Syracuse come to mind. There's also another, much more recent, Colorado team here. 2022 Colorado was bad. There's a reason the university was willing to take a chance on Deion Sanders after this disaster class of a season, yet they rank fairly high here. Why? While it's not their offensive and defensive stats which rank among the worst of the sample, it's partially their fluke overtime win over Cal that kept them from going winless, yet the biggest thing inflating their score is their absolutely brutal strength of schedule. Of their opponents, none were FCS schools, their lone group of five game was against an Air Force squad that finished the year with double digit wins, and seven of their twelve opponents finished the season ranked, three of which in the top ten. Their strength of schedule percentile ranked the highest among the sample size. Which begs the question, how much of Colorado's failings were on the gauntlet the Pac-12 has been the past two years? Considering they're here two other times, probably not a ton, but who knows? At least it helps Colorado escape the abyss. For now. In the teens, you start to see something interesting. Some of these teams appear in back-to-back -back seasons. Duke from 2005 to 07, and 2000 to 01, Kansas from 2015 to 2017, Rutgers from 2018 to 2019, going into the top 10, 2009 to 2010, Washington State, and shockingly, some of these get worse over time. Washington State made an improvement from 2009 to 2010, owing primarily to a better offense and slightly better record. And it's a similar story with Duke from 2005 to 2007 and 2000 to 01. But the rest, for whatever reason, refused to improve on any front. Rutgers went from having a mediocre defense and terrible offense to a terrible offense and terrible defense. And Kansas took a small step forward between 2015 to 16 to then shit the bed in 2017. It's here you also see the Irish national champions, 2022 Northwestern, and the only instance where two of the worst teams of the year actually played each other.
In 2017's college rendition of a Tank Bowl, 2017 Kansas, whose lone win came against Southeastern Missouri State, faced off against 2017 Baylor, a program still reeling from Art Bryles controversy-filled exit from the program. Overall, the 2017 Bears were r relatively alright, with an offense okay enough to keep them in some games, while the Jayhawks, on the other hand, were horrible on all fronts. Even among bad teams, there's no parity, and Baylor would decisively beat Kansas to notch their only win of the season. Entering the top five, we enter into the realm of unimaginably bad. They will collectively have a record of 3-54, and 54, including two losses to FCS schools and one whole conference win. They are, in actuality, the worst teams in college football. God forbid their names be repeated. Two years removed from New York Six bid and finishing the top 15, 2003 Illinois is officially the worst Big Ten team of the 21st century, and they did so with one of the worst defenses in the sample, holding their opponents to an abysmal average of 426.8 yards per game and managing less than a turnover per game. Shockingly, the season didn't even start that bad, with fairly competitive losses to Missouri, UCLA, and Cal, along with beating their FCS team, Illinois State. Starting with conference play, though, the fighting Illini began to fight less and less. Any team with a pulse would demolish them, with their only competitive Big Ten loss being a 14-17 point loss to fellow single-win team, Indiana. It's a horrid team that has largely been forgotten, for a very, very good reason. 2002 Rutgers is the Big East's worst team in their final stretch of relevance, with the Scarlet Knights charging forth with the 21st century's worst offense. Remember back to 2019 LSU's offensive efficiency of 771.63, the mark of a historic offensive performance. 2002 Rutgers, on the other hand, has a 71.22 offensive score, less than a tenth of what the Tigers were able to accomplish, 13.9 points per game, and 3.2 offensive turnovers per game. What's horrifying though is this could have been so, so much worse. 2002 Rutgers had one win, not against their FCS cupcake Villanova, they lost to them 37-19. No, it was against fellow 1-11 team Army, winning 44-0. How did this happen? I'm not exactly sure. Remove that game from the season though, and they average 11.12 points per game. It goes without saying that conference play was a slaughter, even for an extremely top-heavy Big East. They got murdered from everyone from number one Miami to Boston College. Rutgers as a program appeared on this list four separate times, yet this dumpster fire stands alone. Going closer to the modern day, we get to 2021 Arizona, somehow beating out every horrible 2010s Colorado team as one of the worst Pac-12 teams ever. The Wildcats boasted the worst defense in the sample being the only team to get a defensive multiplier less than one. This primarily is due to their allergy to turning over the ball, managing to do so on average once every two games. The worst among the sample. This naturally translated to a lot of losses, including an infamous loss at home to in-state FCS program Northern Arizona. NAU would go 5-6 and six that year, by the way. Somehow, Arizona would also gain the bottom five's only conference win, with Cal once more stepping in and handing an almost winless Pac-12 team their only win. Who knew how generous Berkeley could be? And then we reach our top two, the worst teams ever. Both, however, could be argued to be the worst teams of the sample for reasons I'll get into. Both are winless, both have some of the worst offenses and defenses of the 21st century, and both are a pain in the ass to watch. These are the worst teams in college football. God forbid you ever had to watch them live. 
2020 Vanderbilt was an anomaly among a year full of anomalies. The Commodores, as an SEC football watcher, were a team I expected to be on this list significantly more. Yet, year after year, they're usually able to cobble together three or more wins from Group of Five Cupcakes and other bad SEC teams. Even their one previous appearance for their 2010 season still ranks fairly high. But here's Vandy, right at the bottom, with an overall score of 50.52. Despite starting off strong, only losing by 5 to a really solid Texas A&M, they'd be blown out across the rest of their all-conference COVID schedule, finishing the season 0-9. Their abysmal score is partially due to the usual suspects, horrid offense and defense, yet what really plunges them to the bottom and what puts an asterisk on their claim as the worst team ever is their strength of schedule. It's the worst of the sample, only two of their nine opponents finishing ranked and the rest finishing in the bottom half of the country. Yet the sample size was made intentionally short due to the COVID year and so many other outside forces affected much of the season that I'm willing to almost give this awful team the benefit of the doubt. The other worst team, however, has no saving grace, no benefit of the doubt, and is in my opinion, the worst team in the modern era of college football. 2004 Washington was the worst team of the year, putting together a horrible 1-10 record that ended up getting head coach Keith Gilbertson fired bringing in new head coach Tyrone Willingham to clean up the mess Gilbertson left behind. For three years, the program languished. Willingham failed to put together a single winning season, and in 2008, his job was on the line. It was a make-or-break year for him and the Huskies he tried to pull from the abyss. And it's here where he created his masterpiece. 0-12 0-12, the only winless season in Washington football history, and the worst team of the 21st century. Starting off strong with blowout losses to Oregon and Oklahoma, Willingham's Titanic finally sunk in a 33-7 loss to a pretty mediocre Notre Dame, where he was finally shown the door. Their final winnable game of the season would be against a one-win Washington State in their annual Apple Cup. Nicknamed the Crapple Cup in the press for obvious reasons, the game lived up to the hype as an absolutely disgusting display of what football can be. Going up by 10 in the first half, the Huskies would allow the Cougars to get back in it in the second half, sending the game into overtime at 10-10. What followed was a thrilling field goal duel, which is funny considering 2008 Washington made an average of 53% of their field goals. And sure enough, Washington State would pull it out 16-13. The Huskies would finish the year with a final score of 51.88, just above the COVID Commodores with no worldwide pandemic to blame for their performance. It's rock bottom, not just for the University of Washington, but for college football as a whole. There was truly no place to go. But up. Eight years later, Washington would go from the absolute bottom of the barrel to the second Pac-12 team to reach the playoffs. And while they've been up and down since then, they seem poised to make another run for the playoffs in 2023 as one of the best teams in the nation. You can also look back 13 years prior to their 04 skid that brought them to their infamous 08 campaign. They stood atop the nation as that year's national champion, uh, alongside Miami, but that's neither here nor there. Point is, even when your team is actually the worst team in the nation, maybe of all time, the moment will always be ephemeral. It feels like forever. But the great thing about college ball is how common it is to tear something down, start from scratch, and have a shot at creating something great. This extends beyond the Pacific Northwest too. 2022 Northwestern was just two years removed from winning their division. Colorado's bad years stand in stark contrast to the Midwest powerhouse they were at the beginning of the 2000s. And the 2016 Virginia Cavaliers were three years away from winning their division and securing a New York Six berth. No team, even the worst, are bad forever. These moments of painful, horrible football just make the eventual triumphs all the sweeter. And to those without success, well, at least there's still basketball.